This is my big pleasure to welcome you. Today we have uh, David Ziemkiewicz, who is from uh, Bydgoszcz University of uh, Technology. Uh, he finished his PhD at Nikolaus uh, University uh, at Torun in uh, 2018. But already before, he was working at the Bydgoszcz University of Technology. Uh, his PhD thesis was about uh, materials with negative refractive index. But then he moved to different subjects, to chaos. Uh, he has, as you see, a very nice hobby. Namely, he's constructing very complex devices like crossbow or, or clock from Lego bricks. And he managed to combine it with uh, science, with research. So he also published two uh, physical review A papers, uh, which are connected to this device you can see right now, or something very similar. I think we learned it during this talk. So David, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for this introduction. So uh, thank you very much for coming for this lecture. I will talk about the mechanical clocks and the science behind mechanical clocks. So, of course, the measurement of time is one of the measurements that is the oldest type of measurement we were doing since ancient times, basically, and also one of the most accurate we can do to this day. Uh, and of course, you have many orders of magnitude of the accuracy. Nowadays, we have the atomic clocks, which are uh, unmatched by any mechanical device, of course. But very early mechanical clocks were on the level of 50 minutes per day, which was uh, basically terrible. Uh, these were clocks that were not based on a pendulum because we didn't know the properties of the pendulum, but there were water clocks or some other oscillating devices. And well, 50 minutes per day basically means that uh, if uh, we had some tower clock in the city, then uh, some specialized personnel had to go and correct this clock every few days. Otherwise, it was useless. Then Christian Huygens proposed to use the pendulum and uh, derive the equation for the rate of pendulum and shown that it, its speed is uh, proportional, of course, to the gravitational acceleration and its length. And the pendulum clocks are go were good to about one minute per day, which is basically a good practical measure that can be used in everyday applications. What I will talk about is the clock derived by John Harrison in 1622. He proposed a clock that was uh, over 10 times more uh, accurate than anything that was before. And in fact, it can be quite easily built because this one is the Harrison mechanism. And this clock is basically good to one second per 100 days or about that. This one is not so good. This one is good to one second per, per day if tuned properly. But this is again, this is much better than uh, typical clock we can buy. So, yeah. So basic principles of operation. Uh, most of the mechanical clocks are powered either by gravity or by a spring. Uh, gravity is the better option because uh, force of gravity is very constant as compared to a spring. So we have some weight that's unwinding from some spool and this is powering the clock. In very early medieval clocks, it was uh, literally a piece of rock or a piece of metal. And here is small weight as well. So, of, of course, to measure time, we have to slow down the rate at which this weight drops. So we have several generations and the so-called escapement mechanism. This is the key component of the clock. This is the part that couples the power source with the pendulum. Because, of course, if we just have a free swinging pendulum, then friction will stop it eventually. So we have to deliver power to this pendulum. But on the other hand, we have to deliver power, but in a way that doesn't disturb the pendulum so, so much. So this is a quite interesting mechanical issue. 
And then separately, we have a set of gyrations that uh, drive the clock hands. So of course, we have the ratio of one to 12 between the hands. Okay, so basic, how to realize this with Lego bricks. With Lego bricks, we have a surprisingly large amount of uh, different gears with different number of uh, teeth, so we can generate all sorts of simple ratios to like two to one, three to one, five to one. So for, for example, to get one to 12, I use I one to three, one to two, one to two, and we have 12. There are some uh, less trivial fractions as well. I will take, talk about this more later. But yes, the, hand, the clock designed by John Harrison. So the basic idea was that uh, if you have sufficiently accurate clock, you can use it for navigation, especially for navigation at the sea. Because to uh, calculate our longitude, we only need the position of sun or position of some known stars and exact time. And the exact time was the main problem because uh, if we miss the exact time by one minute, we miss our position by 400 kilometers or so. So it's basically useless. So we had a, we needed a clock that is accurate to less than a minute. This was quite complicated at the sea because the boat is of course moving left to right. So the traditional pendulum clock is not good. Harrison derived a clock that had two pendula that were swinging in opposite directions and this cancelled out the effect of uh, the moving boat. And I did a reproduction of this clock. Uh, unfortunately, this was a bit too delicate to move here, so I will only show, you, um, show a movie later. But, I, but Harrison not only produced the twin pendulum clock, but also a single pendulum clock. And this, this type of escapement mechanism is called grasshopper escapement, because these elements look a bit like the legs of a grasshopper. And since this was not used for navigation and there was little need for so, such an accurate clocks at this time, this type of mechanism was mostly forgotten. So there were little work at this, there, were, there was basically no uh, exhaustive uh, theoretical uh, description of this mechanism. So that's what I did. But first I did a model. So the original grasshopper escapement looks like this, and recreating this exactly like this in Lego was a bit uh, troublesome. So some simplifications were made. Most importantly, I flipped this upside down. So I could, uh, could cover, couple, add all this mechanism directly to the pendulum. So this is a nice simplific simplification. And moreover, the length of these two arms were very different, but I worked out a configuration where the arms are mostly the same length. So the torque, provided to the pendulum when it's swinging left and right is exactly the same. And this was important for accuracy, as it turns out. And this is basically the same mechanism that I have here. So I published this about one year ago. And since then, many people coupled this because this, it, it turns out this is not only one of the simplest type, types of mechanisms that can be done with Lego but also one of the most accurate ones at the same time. So there are all uh, constructions done by various people around the world. This works. So why this grasshopper escapement is so good? There are several uh, interesting things about this. Most of all, there's no static friction because the mechanism never fully stops. In almost all other mechanisms, we have a wheel that is stopped at some position and then when it's approached by the pendulum, it gives it a short push and then stops again. And this is a problematic from the standpoint of uh, efficiency because uh, to start it moving and then to stop, we have to overcome the static friction. But if it moves all the time, there's no static friction. So this alone reduces our power needs by a factor of two or three. Moreover, there's no kinetic friction as well, 
because there are no sliding surfaces. Again, in most of the mechanisms, we have, when we are pushing, pushing the pendulum, we have some sliding surfaces. And this is the uh, main uh, source of wear in the mechanism. In the wristwatches as well, we have mechanisms that use ceramic surfaces. Here, no. Here, not. But there are two other things that are quite controversial. With grasshopper escaping, the pendulum is never free. It's pushed all the time. This is a bit weird because we think that to not disturb the motion of the pendulum, we want a short impulse, not pushing it all the time. So this is very far from the ideal mathematical pendulum. And also the pendulum amplitude is considerable, often over 10 degrees. Here is a bit smaller, here is a bit uh, about 5 degrees, but again, Ideal mathematical pendulum works only if the amplitude is very small. So what's going on here? And due to these factors, mostly, the work of Harrison was uh, mostly ignored by scientists because uh, they said this cannot be accurate. This is uh, very far from the ideal pendulum. But it turns out there is very interesting thing that happens. This is a result of computer simulation, but uh, since then I tested it in Lego class and it works as well. So on the right side, right side we have the driving torque and amplitude. And of course, uh, as the driving torque increases, the amplitude increases as well. That's uh, logical. But now we have two separate errors. First is the so-called circular error. And this is the difference between physical pendulum and ideal mathematical pendulum. Physical pendulum, when the amplitude increases, its period is very slightly increasing too. It's not constant. And this increase is uh, proportional uh, to the square of the amplitude, more or less. But then it happens that the escapement error, which is the uh, error introduced by the escapement mechanism as a byproduct of adding energy to the pendulum, is negative. So it means that it speeds up the pendulum. This is also quite logical. If we are pushing the pendulum forward to keep it in motion, we are speeding it up. And now the magic happens. This is proportional to the square of amplitude. This is proportional more or less linearly to the amplitude. If we add the two, we get a parabola. If, if, and if we tune the torque, so we are right here, then in some small region, the clock will be totally insensitive to the driving torque. So the driving torque can change. It can be slightly larger, slightly smaller. The speed will be the same. And this happens only with the grasshopper escapement. So a bit mad, there won't be much mad here, but a bit. The circular error is given by such expression because this cannot be computed exactly. So we can only use approximation. But the really important factor is only the first one, which is basically proportional to the square of the amplitude because here we have amplitude in radians. Amplitude is less than five degrees, so in radius it's a very small number, so of course we can use the approximation. It's, and this is this quadratic term you are seeing. And uh, for grasshopper escapement, I could derive, this is also approximation, but quite a good one. The relation, how the uh, uh, period changes with the amplitude and it is proportional more or less linearly to the amplitude and with minus sign. So the error is negative, proportional to the amplitude, and if we add the positive and proportional to the square of amplitude, we have the parabola. And for this exact reason, just quite recently, in 2015, uh, a group of enthusiasts built the clock exactly to the Harrison specifications, and it holds current uh, world record of accuracy, uh, 0.6 seconds of error in 100 day of test. So this is uh, the current limit of clock 
working in a regular environment because we have some clocks that have a pendular suspended in vacuum and they are electromechanical clocks and they can be quite a bit more accurate than that, but this is the absolute record in normal environment. So with this, I could explain why this is so accurate, this relation here. And it turned out nobody else did such calculations before, so I could uh, publish this as a research paper. So starting from Lego bricks, I got a research paper in physical review. But I get a bit further with the studies because there is some noise when we uh, measure the period of the clock. So one period to second period, there is some variation here. And uh, it is easy to dismiss it as just as random noise, but there is uh, some, there are some other processes, underlying processes here. For example, not only the pendulum is swinging, but uh, other parts of the mechanism are also moving, and the whole case may be also, be also moving, especially if this is just a freestanding structure, not, for example, attached to the wall. Uh, so we have one pendulum, and the case can be uh, interpreted as a second pendulum, and then basically you have a double pendulum, which is a chaotic system. And it turned out that, uh, indeed, we can see the chaotic behavior in the motion of the clock. So uh, this is again computer simulation. So this is the error. It, it seems uh, shows some random variation. Here is a total error. And while there are some quasi random variations in the total error, there are also uh, evident large scale structures. So here we have the oscillation with the period of 30 minutes, despite the fact that in the system, in fact, there's nothing with a period of 30 minutes because the pendulum has a period of 1.5 seconds and the vibrations of the mechanism are even faster. And yet we see long time processes here. And uh, processes like this uh, resulted from the chaotic motion. So how to test it experimentally? Normally, if we do the experiment with a pendulum in the laboratory for the undergraduate students, we usually use some optical system to measure the pendulum. But with clocks, we, have, we are in a good position that the clock is ticking. So all we have to do is to record the sound. And this is very easy to do with no special equipment. And uh, regular sound recording has a frequency of about 40,000 uh, hertz, so we have an uh, accuracy of well below one millisecond. So I did exactly that. I uh, recorded the ticking. Then just it was just a matter to, uh, of finding the positions of the peaks and measuring the distance between them. We can see that the ticks are uh, sometimes they are a bit quieter, sometimes a bit louder. This is a good indication that there is some false variation in the system. And of course, there's some random noise. So yeah, this is this is a measurement of the Lego clock. The Lego clock was built to have a period of 1.8 seconds. Uh, the average value with is the red line is a bit above, so it was not fully tuned at this point. But it is quite accurate. And there is a relatively little variation. We see that 300 of a second at most. And at the first glance, this looks a bit like a normal distribution because most of the results are near the mean. There are relatively few outliers. So this was my first guess. Is this a normal distribution? Well, no. Turns out not exactly. So in the experimental data, when I tried to fit the normal distribution, then the central part fitted quite well. But the number of outliers was considerably larger than expected. So I couldn't fit a clear caution to this. Uh, so what is happening here? Turns out that the distribution of these periods can be explained with Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. 
So the basic principle was that, that I assumed that I have a set of girls, 10, 20, less than 100, that interact with each other by collisions. They are just spinning freely up to the point where they collide with each other and then they transfer energy between each other. And uh, we know such a system in physics. This is the ideal gas theory. You have a set of particles that exchange an, uh, energy only by collisions. So this is basically the same. And it turns out that if you simulate a set of gas, even, even 10 of them, then the resulting histogram is very close to Maxwell Boltzmann distribution. So this is a good distribution to use to model the forces acting on a clock. And it worked. This is simulation result where the noise was modeled by Maxwell Dawson distribution and this is basically identical to what I was seeing in the experiment. So this is a new result too, because uh, as far as I know, no, nobody else tried to model it like that. Um, okay. So the simulation results can we can do not only the statistics, but we can do a comparison of how visually the error function looks. Uh, so the total error of the clock. And here again, the experiment and the simulation show very, very similar structure, which is quite a different than if we could use a normal distribution of the error. Uh, so the shape is very similar. Moreover, the shape is self-similar. This is another interesting feature, that if we zoom out on a small fragment, it looks basically identical, identical to the whole thing. So the error function is a fractal. And I could calculate the dimension of the fractal because the fractals have a dimension that is not a whole number, but a fractional number, just the name. And the dimension of the fractal uh, also indicated that uh, this is not a normal distribution, but something else. Uh, moreover, a distribution it's, has shown that the pendulum has a memory. In other words, the pendulum remembers not the, only the moment uh, that is now, but all the impulses it received in the recent past because of course the, the total energy of the pendulum is much, much greater than energy um, given in one cycle. So the pendulum has a memory uh, and it, ca it can be calculated by calculating the dimension, fractal dimension of this plot. And the final thing that I tested, which was quite unexpected, because uh, quite recently I came across multiple, multiple papers on atomic clocks where it has been shown that there is some correlation between the uh, accuracy of atomic clock and the amount of entropy it generates, how much it increases the entropy of the environment. So it has been shown for quantum systems, it, ha it has been shown for microscopic uh, electromechanical systems. So the question is, is this just a strictly quantum mechanism or is this something that is general and I could see this in a very macroscopic system? And it turns out, of course I can. <laughs> so here was a parameter, uh, derived in the paper I cited, which is the ratio of the period to the standard deviation of the period. And here is the entropy. In this plot I have in arbitrary units, but I had it calculated in proper units in the paper. And it turns out the relation is very much linear and uh, pretty much the same regardless of what mechanism I use. So this is not a feature of this particular clock, this particular Lego structure or this particular type of mechanism. This is just some uh, general type of relation. Uh, of course, uh, calculating precisely the amount of entropy this generates is quite an uh, impossible task. So I just assumed that uh, all the energy 
given to the pendulum is lost in friction sooner or later, so it all gets dissipated as a heat. Uh, of course, the relation was linear, but the exact numbers were very, very far from the uh, upper limit that was uh, derived in the cited paper by about uh, eight orders of magnitude. So by no means this is the limit of what is possible here. But it worked. And uh, and submitted a paper on this uh, recent, and it got uh, accepted three days ago. So <laughs> that's very funny. So yes, the grasshopper escape is the most accurate clock mechanism we know, and it can be justified theoretically, which nobody else cared to do, basically. Uh, the level of accuracy possible with simple Lego clock is about 10 seconds per day. With a proper clock, it can be one second per 100 days. Uh, recording the sound is the simplest way of measuring the speed of the clock. And there is a lot of uh, things to distinguish when we analyze the random noise that is not really random and not really only noise because we have the fact, actual random noise, which is more or less Brown in motion, time-correlated random noise, which is called the generalized Brown in motion, and how much time correlation there is depends on the fractional dimension of the plot, and also chaotic motion, which can or cannot happen depending on how much damping is in the system, how it is uh, exactly constructed. And finally, the result that the rate of uh, increase of entropy in the environment is directly linked to the accuracy is true for mechanical clocks too, not only for atomic systems. Which can we say, we can say that this dates back to the 6022 when Harrison proposed his clock and he chose to have very high pendulum uh, amplitude and uh, Basically, very high pendulum amplitude also means that there are a lot of losses to air friction, so it is not bad, actually. And this is the main part, and I have some extra information. I will check the time. Yes, still has plenty of time, so yeah. we can, yes, we can see for the part. Okay. So one thing that I had to calculate to do the, to do the calculation measurements is the Q quality factor of the pendulum, Q factor. So the simplest way is just to have a scale in degrees and a free swinging pendulum, just get it moving and record the exponential decay of the amplitude. So the decay is, for large amplitudes, it is faster than exponential, in fact, due to a friction mostly. Below some amplitude, we get a linear relation. So from the fitting onto this part, I could get the Q factor. Uh, for Lego clock, the Q factor is about 1,000. For uh, regular metal clocks, it is up to 10,000. Uh, and as I said, to just make a clock that shows time, you have only single fractions like 1 to 12, 1 to 60. But there are also more complicated mechanisms because uh, even in very old clocks, you had all sorts of uh, additional complications like uh, showing the moon phase, for example. And this is quite an interesting thing because the moon phase uh, indicator in typical clock uses a wheel that, that does uh, one rotation per two moon, uh, per two lunar months. So it is 59 days with some uh, fractional number there, here. And almost everyone uses this approximation, which is good to the, to the thousands, basically. So by using this, we have a moon phase that is accurate up to one day in 122 years. So accurate enough for all normal applications, so to speak. But the problem with this is the seven. 
Making a uh, ratio of seven in Lego bricks is complicated because there are no gears that have a multiple of seven in the number of gears. So I had to improvise. But on the other hand, we have differential, just like in cars. Differential in cars is a device that uh, uh, receives the power from the engine and divides this to two wheels. And the number of rotations of the engine is equal to the sum of the rotations of the wheels. So we can the addition, we can the subtraction with the differential. And this can be leveraged. So you have uh, wise, nice numbers like 60, 64, 25. And we get result like this, which is good to the fifth decimal place. So errors one day in 7,000 years. So this is a far, far better realization of this complication. Uh, later, I, in the dual pendulum clock that recreated the Harrison clock that I will show a video of, uh, I used this, uh, another approximation that is also good to one day in 7,000 years, that also uses simple fractions. And I could also um, derive the way to use the same durations to get a calendar. So with the calendar, again, we have a ugly number, points to four to five, but it could be approximated like this and the error is one day in 1600 years. So again, more accurate than anyone would need ever. Finally, third thing that I did was the so-called equation of time because the clock moves at a steady rate. But if we try to read the time, for, for example, for a sundial, then we find out that the sun is not at the very top or exactly at the 12. Because the uh, Earth's orbit is a bit elliptical, also its axis a bit, is a bit tilted. So there are two correction factors, basically. Both are sinusoidal, so the sum is something like this. And this could also be realized with Lego. <laughs> Again, I had, to, I had to generate two sine waves and then add them in differential. And this is what I did here. So here is the angle, uh, angle that this was, uh, does one rotation per year. This does two rotations per year. So if we have uh, a rotating element like this, like a steam engine, then the linear motion is sinusoidal. So here is sine, here is sine of uh, two alpha, sine of alpha, and here is the output, which is sum of the two. And finally, because uh, before I uh, started my research on grasshopper escapement, uh, I did some models of other mechanisms. Uh, one of them is so-called uh, Arntfield escapement. And this is interesting case because this is probably the only escapement mechanism that, is, uh, uh, that was uh, devised in the 20th century. So it is not an old invention. It is invented in 1970. And this works on, to on a totally different principle because here we have this funny interaction between the error uh, produced by the escapement and the error produced by the amplitude that cancel each other. Here, we just accept that there is error caused by amplitude. But uh, instead, we try to keep the amplitude as constant as possible. And uh, I will show the movies in a moment, but uh, basically, uh, here is an element that interacts with the pendulum. And this element uh, just uh, pushes on the pendulum just with the force and gravity and nothing else. And then the pendulum goes free. And this is lifted up. And then in the, in the next cycle, cycle, again, the pendulum picks it up and lifts it down. So just like that, we have a very precisely defined portion of potential energy, gravitational energy that is delivered to the pendulum in every cycle. And again, uh, Dr. Enguji from the Cambridge University got interested in this mechanism and introduced it to his students. They did some precise measurements 
And we can see here, uh, the test was 15,000 seconds, so it's about uh, over 10 hours. And the maximum error they had is basically one tenth of a second. So again, this is well under one second per day. And this is uh, the whole presentation. Uh, for many more clocks and also other constructions like the mentioned crossbow, <laughs> uh, I can I have them in my uh, channel. And right now I will show some of this mechanism in action. So this is a typical medieval mechanism. We have no pendulum, we have a horizontal bar with two weights. And depending on where we place these weights, we can change the inertia on the system, and uh, so we can regulate the rate. The problem of this is that the speed of this bar is directly proportional to the force, so it's not very accurate. And here is a Lego model of this. So. Even in this, you can see that uh, the speed of this bar is not exactly constant. It's sometimes it's a bit faster, sometimes a bit slower. So it is a not good timekeeper. Here, a Graham escapement. This is a, what we can see in 99% of our clocks because it's just simple. And it works, but it is not very accurate. And also it relies on the sliding friction. So the parts were out. And here is my interpretation of this mechanism. Again, we have quite a lot of sliding friction, so this is not good for operating in, for months or years. Here is the Harrison's clock with the dual pendulum, which was the clock that could work uh, independent of the level of the ground, so it could work on the board. And again, this is a realization in Lego bricks, which is quite uh, big and inefficient. So here is the single pendulum model of this. So basically, it's called grasshopper escapement because these thin little legs. And this also could be done with Lego, technically. But again, the whole structure is very large and we have a custom built the wooden wheel, which is many, many times larger than gears. So my interpretation was quite a revolution here because it is uh, easy 10 times more efficient. And here's the arm field escape. As, as I said, this arm just pushes on the pendulum with the force of gravity only, and then the pendulum goes free and the arm is lifted back up. So we have only force of gravity acting on the pendulum. And here is my realization with Lego. So this was probably my first clock that got, uh, was accurate up to less than one minute per day. And this is another model of this escapement. Here I used a double weighted pendulum that has weight uh, over and under the pivot point to slow it down. And this is what we see in the most wristwatches. So again, we rely on sliding frictions here. So that's why we use uh, sapphire and other um, stones with a very low friction coefficient. And technically it can be done with Lego, but it's not very efficient. But it works more or less. <laughs> <laughs> you should use it on your hand. <laughs> mm -hmm. So this is that. And this is the horizon clock I mentioned. Which again, I couldn't bring it here because it's a, a bit too delicate. But we have the hours, minutes, seconds, moon phase, equation of time, so the difference between the time and the solar time, and also the time of sunrise and sunset. Because again, there are sine waves that could be quite easily modeled mechanically. And on the left, I had a stamp up and the calendar. 
<laughs> so yeah, this monstrosity took me three months to build and has about uh, 120 girls in it. So making it work with little friction was quite a challenge. So, okay, the last thing I have is a bit more theoretical. So I did the analysis of all other escapement mechanisms. But because they can be mostly classified by at which point the pendulum is pushed. So the so-called chronometer escapement pushes the pendulum only in one direction, direction, only in very narrow angle range near the zero angle. And like that, you have reduced the escapement error basically to zero. So this was what caused the clockmakers to use this type of escapement for a long time because the escapement error is zero. To, so uh, the pushing has basically no impact on the period. But still we have the error caused by the non-zero amplitude. So it is not the best possible. And again, I have shown that if we change just little this angle range so that it is asymmetric and pushed only on the way up, then we can create a local minimum of, of error. And so if we turn the pendulum to be exactly here, then it is not sensitive to the force changes. But this local minimum is quite steep and in any realistic uh, realization of this, it will be steep. So it is uh, quite a troublesome make. So again, this was a bit different ge geometry, but the same and again, very steep minimum, local minimum. And Pushing it all the way down is terrible. So it's not something we would like to do because the error from the amplitude is here. The error from escaping is here. The sum of the two is linear. So I guess if we have some additional compensating mechanism that is also linear, then this would be good. But overall, this is not a good solution. And this is not relevant here. And this is grasshopper escaping. So it's weird in the fact that it pushes the pendulum all the time, but it produces a nice, very shallow parabola. So we have a shallow local minimum of error. We can turn the pendulum to be exactly here. And uh, one can say that uh, this may seem like the as far from free pendulum as we can get, uh, but on the other hand, if the force is pushing the pendulum all the time, the force of friction is also working all the time, and the pendulum is, uh, has a constant amplitude, so the two forces have produced uh, the same work, then the forces are more or less the same. And so, if we add an additional friction force, which opposes this, they will be almost the same almost all the time. So in fact, the pendulum is basically free because there are no net forces except the gravity force. So that's another interpretation of how pendulum that's pushed all the time can be actually very accurate. So, So this is all I had today. Thank you very much. So let's thank the speaker. Um, maybe let's switch on the light on the stage. And I propose that we switch the view of the camera uh, to this camera such that online participants can see it, the clock. Check it's working. Okay. So I can make some zoom. Okay, so this is the clock for those of you who are online. 
but it's better that we'll be here. Uh, and now we have time for questions. If someone will ask the question, we we'll start with people who are here, then just raise your hand and I can give you uh, this, this, uh, this microphone. This. Okay, so you do this first. Uh, yes, hello, thanks for a very nice uh, presentation. And uh, I wonder what would be the difference if the, uh, the contact would not be, um, how to say, uh, on the moment, like you said that it, this impacts, uh, say this Boltzmann distribution, this also, uh, I know this, these forces also work only at the impact. I wonder if uh, the pieces had some, I don't know, elasticity, or if even if the interaction was like, I don't know, uh, electromagnetic, if this would uh, cause some difference in the this better or worse place? Yes, this is a very interesting question because I assume that the uh, parts are perfectly rigid and they just collide and that's it. But, but yes, uh, in fact, this would be, uh, I don't know how, the, how much different it would look like, but I suspect it will look like a bit different. Um, the impacts, I would also say, they were not uh, once per second or twice per second, but few thousand impacts per second to get the distribution. So I think that the friction, the actual friction between the surfaces is, in fact, a series of very little impacts. So I assume that the impacts are perfectly elastic. But... Other questions? I think the first one was there, and then Victor. Thank you. This is a quick one. This is like a nice question for talking, I guess. Uh, you mentioned at some point that your processes had memory and that um, you, you, you can connect this with a fractal dimension mm -hmm. of it. I, I was keen, like if you could say a little bit more, because for me it's not clear how the memory of the process ah, can be uh, yes, connected yes. with this. Uh, Thank you. So basically, if we have a trajectory of non-Abronian notion, this is a, quite a jagged trajectory. And if we zoom in or zoom out, we see basically all the same. So it is self-similar. And this, it has some fractal dimension. If I remember correctly, for ideal Brownian notion, the dimension is 1.5 exactly. Uh, but here I got, I think 1.7. So this was the indication that it's not pure uh, Brownian notion, but there is some underlying processes. And basically, the closer we get to two, uh, the longer distance correlations are in the data. So uh, this means that the pendulum, we can say, remembers all the history of the impulses given to them in a given time. Because this pendulum, when disconnected, disconnected from the clock, it will swing freely for about half an hour. The quality factor of this is like this. So it, um, we can say that it remembers half an hour of, of a history. And this is uh, seen in the data. So the dimension of 1.7, interestingly, was very close to the uh, stock prices in the stock exchange. Because here we also have some random, no random noise, but also some long time correlations. So it was very similar to this. Thank you. Victor? So this talk showed me that nothing is impossible. It's something in just fantastic. But I didn't understand. I missed maybe the point. You showed some histogram and, and, and uh, showed a red curve and said this is in the wings, there is no fitting. Mm -hmm. And then you applied the idea of uh, idea of gas and then it's now fine but i didn't see the result of this fitting it ah. still was yes uh, yes wings yes. were not explained i did not yes in fact uh okay i got this so yes in fact i did not do an exact fit I just I just uh, used this Maxwell Boltzmann distribution, uh, added it to the numerical simulation, 
and then the numerical simulation, which is the blue result, is basically exactly identical to the experiment. But I did not try to fit it again with the exact curve. I have another question. Can I? Don't yes. Yeah. Or maybe uh, first, maybe we can give also the voice to online participants. So we have a question of uh, Professor Alexander Vitin. Thank you. Thank you for beautiful talk and very, 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 very amusing. Did you consider putting your clock in the vacuum? Then <laughs> eliminate Boltzmann, Maxwell distribution, all that, and see what is more or less intrinsic uh, Q factor. Moreover, with some luck, you could even be able to cool it some time and then see how much rigidity of your components would correspond to to to, to increase uh, even more quality factor so you could eliminate brownian mo motion altogether on almost altogether it should be feasible mm -hmm. yes yes uh, well putting it in vacuum is com quite complicated from the practical practical perspective but uh, yes this will change uh, many things quite a bit as for the quality factor, I estimated that about two thirds of the uh, friction comes from the air friction and the rest is just a friction of the mechanism. So it just, uh, it could uh, increase the quality factor by a factor of three, basically. Uh, but uh, indeed, the, the random uh, fluctuations might change quite dramatically, although I'm not exactly sure if the noise comes from the air and the collision with air molecules or the noise comes from the mechanism itself and the thermal vibration of the mechanism. And also not, not only thermal vibration, but also the friction, which is somewhat random. Uh, I mean, because this linear structure, there are, I think, even in the building where you are now, they are cryostas that your clock would fit inside. So pumping it out should be feasible. You would need to put some camera or some window, but that's feasible. Thank yeah. you. Maybe, yes, yes, maybe, maybe yes. I, I'm not sure what exactly would it turn on, but, but this is interesting proposition to, to make because basically I, I had a fixed uh, time step in the simulation so I couldn't really simulate individual particles uh, impacting the pendulum because the time step was basically, if I remember correctly, one millisecond so they are quite macroscopic impacts. But I, I, the only thing I wanted to show that the relation is linear, but uh, accurate up to order of magnitude. No, I didn't do exact calculations because I know that this is not possible without uh, vacuum, as you say. So, so yeah. Okay, so this is something to consider. And then there is the next question of uh, of Victor, Professor Pregameszczyk. I still concerning about this. If you if you use Maxwell kind of distribution and uh, ideal gas, then it should be, I believe, Gaussian. Everything should be Gaussian. Are you saying this is not Gaussian? Then I don't understand at which stage Gaussian makes something un-Gaussian. Uh, yes, because. It is quite indirect because I use the distribution to model the forces, the friction forces, which were like that. But here I have the pendulum period, so it is not so trivial to uh, calculate how one distribution affects the other. And that's why I didn't even try to calculate this analytically because I know this is how hopeless. So I only plugged in the distribution of forces to the simulation and shown that this is the same. So this is observation more than. Uh, are there more questions? Next question, Julius. I think the last one. Uh, yes, yeah, so you showed that there is some uh, correspondence to actual Boltzmann distribution. And so we know that in ideal gas, uh, these gases, you know, they, the behavior depends on some parameters, for example, like uh, temperature. So could you assign some effective temperature to it or calculate some effective I don't know, heat capacity of this uh, 
years. <laughs> Yes, whatever it yes, is. Yes. This is what, yeah, this is very interesting. And I considered that, but then I came to the conclusion that I will just leave it as a numerical arbitrary parameter because uh, effective temperature of Lego gears is just, just like, just like uh, the physicists sometimes say about effective temperatures of single particles that we have millions of Kelvins, but this is meaningless more or less. So here it would be meaningless as well, I think. Uh, okay, so before we thank the speaker again, I have announcements. The first one is that next week we'll have a talk of Professor Rzyczkowski about this quantum Sudoku, which was in the viewpoint of physical review letters. The second announcement is very complicated. It's about tax system in Poland, which is... <laughs> <laughs> and there are some changes, as you know. And the, the, this announcement I was asked uh, by uh, a counter to say you that if you ask the institute to help you with different versions of of the final taxes you will pay the announcement is that it's very complicated and they cannot do it <laughs> so we'll uh, continue we'll follow what we're doing so far despite the fact that there are now other options which are not so clear yet okay so that's everything and let's thank the speaker again.